Hi, my name's Mike Best, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to share with you a little bit about my life's journey and how God has walked me through some very difficult times. I want us to reflect for a moment. Have you ever had a life event that just rocked your world and it knocked you to your knees? To where fear gripped your heart to the point to where you, you found it difficult to breathe? You didn't know how you were going to make it? You, uh, you didn't know what next steps to take? You didn't know what you were going to do? And your thoughts, they were running 90 to nothing. But in that moment, it was like time just stood still. Can you relate to what I'm talking about? To where an event happened in your life and it placed your plans, your expectations on hold in one single moment of time. January 27, 1985 was just such an occasion for me. The birth of my daughter Christina was supposed to be a happy and joy-filled occasion. She looked so perfect and she was beautiful eight pounds, 20 inches long, and there hadn't been any indication of trouble throughout the pregnancy. Our pediatrician did an initial exam in the hospital following Christina's birth and detected a, a slight heart murmur. So to be on the safe side, the doctor ordered some tests. And what those tests revealed and what came next was a total shock. For in that moment, my plans, my expectations, changed just like that. A pediatric cardiologist was immediately called to do further testing. He did an echocardiogram and a heart catheterization. Another doctor was called in uh, to do genetic testing and when those tests came back, it wasn't good. Christina had a non-operable heart and lung condition along with a genetic abnormality called trisomy 18 or Edwards syndrome. The genetic doctor was very matter-of-fact and painted a very bleak picture. The bottom line, babies diagnosed with full-blown Edwards syndrome, as in the case of Christina, most die within weeks following birth, and 95% die before their first birthday. And if they do survive, they will be non-ambulatory, meaning they can't walk, they can't talk, they can't sit up, they can't feed themselves. You have to use a gavage technique, a feeding tube to feed your baby. That was Christina's future. And we were told to take her home, make her as comfortable as possible, and enjoy her for as long as we would have her. So we did. The first month I began to educate myself on what we could do for Christina and provide for her immediate needs to detect if she was in distress or discomfort and, and better support her. One month passed, then two, then month three, all the time waiting for the inevitable, but somehow trying to believe God for a miracle. Now, I must confess, in my heart, I was very conflicted. I knew God could answer prayer, but the inevitable that we were facing was so big, so horrible, and so sad that all I could see was the inevitable. Fear gripped my heart to the point where I was afraid to, to go into her room for a nighttime feeding, not knowing if she was dead or alive. During the day, while at work, the phone would ring, I would be almost afraid to pick it up because I might hear, Mike, you need to come home. Christina has died. See, I was waiting for the inevitable. And because of that, it was hard to believe God for a miracle. And I'm so thankful that God had a different plan. Month four ended, month five passed, and then month six came and something began to change in my heart. Faith began to germinate deep in my spirit. God was leading me to step out in faith and to stop waiting around for the inevitable and start believing Him for a miracle. And it became more about expecting and seeing Christina thrive rather than die. And here's when that heart change came. One day around Christina's sixth month, I was in prayer face down in the carpet prostrate before the Lord, pouring out my heart to God. And as I was praying, I sensed the Lord's presence unlike what I have ever felt before. I knew the Lord was there, so I stopped praying 
and I started waiting and listening. And it was in the quietness of that moment when the Lord spoke to my heart and spirit as clearly as I'm speaking to you right now. And this is what he said. Her days will be long and her life full. She will sing forth my praise and will declare my name to my people. Did I hear that right? Her days will be long and her life full. She will sing forth my praise and declare my, my name to my people. What do you mean, God? Her days will be long and her life full. Don't you understand? She isn't supposed to live beyond her first birthday. What do you mean she's going to sing forth your praise and declare your name to your people? Didn't you hear what the doctor said? She's not supposed to even be able to talk. This can't be right. God, I'm not hearing you right. But God, in his loving and gentle way, again spoke to my spirit. Her days will be long and her life full. She will sing forth my praise and declare my name to my people. I said, God, I don't know what this means. I'm having a hard time getting my head around all of this, but I trust you and I promise that every day of her life, I will pray this over her, that her days will be long and her life will be full and she will sing forth your praise and she will declare your name to your people. So fast forward. Christina began to develop at her own pace and schedule. She learned how to roll, not crawl, to get where she wanted to go. It was the cutest thing. She would extend that arm up above her head and she would lay out on one side of the room and she would roll to get to the other side. And then she, she would uh, reach for uh, furniture to try to pull herself up and stiffen her legs in order to pull herself up and then teetering between the coffee table and the, and the couch, she would do that waddle walk, balancing her steps so that she learned how to walk. Now, normal child development, children normally walk around their first birthday. Christina didn't start walking until around she was two and a half years old. And then after that, she started crawling. Her development was all backwards here. But it, yet, it was on her own pace and her own schedule. So, when Christina turned five years old, I wanted to take her back to the genetic doctor, and here's why. At that initial diagnosis meeting, the doctor uh, could tell that I was not totally grasping the full impact of her diagnosis. So, she laid it out like this. When everyone else's child sits up and yours doesn't, when everyone else's child talks and yours doesn't, when everyone else's child walks and yours doesn't, maybe you'll believe what you're hearing today. You see, the genetic doctor's God was science and cold hard statistics. There wasn't any room for a miracle. She didn't believe in them. In fact, she says, I know you don't want to hear this. There aren't any miracles with full-blown trisomy 18. They just don't happen. So when, I, when Christina turned five, I picked up the phone and I called the Fort Worth Child Study Center and I told them who I was and I asked to speak to that specific genetic doctor. And when the doctor answered, I said, this is Mike Best. Do you remember me and my daughter, Christina? And she said, well, why, yes, I, I remember you and Christina. Now, I found that somewhat odd that she remembered Christina having not seen her since birth. But it was rare to have a child as old as Christina with full-blown Edwards syndrome. And unbeknownst to me, this doctor had been following Christina's medical condition over the past five years. And then she asked the magic question. The one question I was wanting to answer. She asked, how is Christina doing? And I couldn't wait to take my shot. I said, Doc, Christina can walk. She can talk. She dresses herself. She feeds herself. I'm teaching her how to ride her tricycle. She's attending kindergarten. And I could hear the disbelief, the doubt, and almost disdain because the genetic doctor thought I was delusional and living in some sort of fantasy. For you see, she had heard stories like this from parents before. And when it came time for the child to do the things that their parents said that they could do, the child couldn't perform. 
So the day of the appointment came and Christina was seated next to me in the, in the waiting room. And in walks the genetic doctor. Looking around the room, she called Christina Best. Christina gets up from her place. She stands, she walks over and she goes to the doctor and she says, Hi, doctor. The genetic doctor dropped her knees and said, Your daddy tried to tell me that you could do all of these wonderful things, but I didn't believe him. Again, her, her God was the God of science and statistics. There was no room for a miracle, but there had to be a logical reason why Christina was able to do what she was able to do. And looking for that reason, the doctor did another genetic test to confirm her original diagnosis. She believed the lab had messed up the original results, and when it came back again, full-blown Edwards syndrome. The genetic doctor had to face the reality that not all diagnoses end up the way that she predicts. And from that point on, her lectures regarding genetic abnormalities changed. When speaking about trisomy 18, Edwards syndrome, after giving all the science and statistics, she would say, but there's one. And she would talk about Christina. At the University of Houston in a pre-med class, this genetic doctor was again lecturing on trisomy 18 and as she concluded, she said, however, there's one that has gone against all the odds and is what we would consider an anomaly, not a miracle, an anomaly to the norm. A student that I had taught in high school was seated in the back of that lecture hall. He raised his hand and he asked, are you talking about Christina Best? And the doctor said, yes, I am. And he said, she's amazing. When she was first born, our church prayed for her that God would raise her up and that she would be able to become more than what was initially diagnosed. We've seen her grow. We've seen her develop beyond all expectation. She is truly amazing. And I would call her a miracle. And at that point, the doctor said, well, I won't go that far, but I will say that Christina is one in a million. Fast forward. Christina graduated from Boswell High School. She worked as a hostess at a local restaurant in Saginaw, Texas. Later, she worked as an assistant to the activities director at a nursing home in Fort Worth. She sang in the choir. She even sang solos all in fulfillment of what God had spoken to my heart years ago, that her days will be long, her life full, and she will sing forth my praise and declare my name to my people. It was Easter 2013. I was involved in multiple musical services when the call came. Christina had a respiratory event and was taken to the hospital, and she was there for 19 days. Now, the goal was to get her stable enough for us to bring her home. And once home, arrangements were made to help her with uh, medical care. We had home health come in throughout the week to check on her and to monitor her meds and vitals. We set up shifts around the clock to be there to always have a family member there. And from May 2013 forward, we saw a physical transition take place to where we transitioned from home health to palliative care, and then finally from palliative care to hospice. I remember sitting with Christina day after day. I took the afternoon and early shifts, Monday through Friday, and the daytime hours on Saturday and Sundays, still believing God still trusting God, but over the past 28 years of doing life with Christina, my focus had shifted from this temporary life we experience here on this earth to the one that we will experience once we transition from this earth. Paul said over in 2 Corinthians 5.8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I don't have time to share all the stories of how God was preparing Christina and me for what was coming next, but it was a faith builder. For example, I will share one. Christina was in her hospital bed and I was sitting next to her in her room. There wasn't a sound in the house. She wasn't on any type of drug that would produce hallucinations. And all of a sudden, she reaches over and she grabs me by the arm and she asks, Dad, do you hear that? I went, hear what, baby? She said, the music. It's so beautiful. I couldn't hear anything. She said again, Dad, 
Do you hear that? They're, they're singing. They're, they're singing and worshiping Jesus. And again, I, I couldn't hear anything. And Christina began to slowly lift her hands. In worship, joining the heavenly host, she began to sing, worthy, 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 as tears rolled down her cheeks. See, God had allowed me to be a part of that moment and other moments like that one, not only for me to know He was preparing her for what comes next, but He was also preparing me. Christina went peacefully into the presence of Jesus on January 28, 2014. She was 28 years old. She lived a full life, a long life. Her, in fact, much longer than was ever expected. She sang forth His praise. She declared His name to His people. And when it became to talking about Jesus with others, she was a lioness, full of boldness and without fear. So how did we get through this 28-year trial? Well, there were three things. We had to stop waiting for the inevitable and start believing God for a miracle. I don't know what situation or trial you're facing in your own life, but I know this, that if we stop waiting for the inevitable and we start believing and trusting God for a miracle, wonderful things begin to happen. I love what Luke 1.37 says, With God, nothing is impossible. Matthew 19, 16 says, With man, this is impossible. And yes, it was. It was totally impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Stop waiting for the inevitable and start believing God for a miracle. The second thing we had to do is found over in James 1, 3, where it says, We know that the testing of our faith produces perseverance, and that perseverance finishes its work. We had to let the testing within our trial produce that perseverance. Perseverance that that takes us all the way to the finish line, takes us all the way to go the distance. When they first started manufacturing golf balls, they made the cover smooth. Now, golfers know this. And they discovered that after a ball had been roughed up, that one could get more distance out of it So they they started manufacturing them with dimpled covers. And that's the way it is with life. It takes those rough spots, the effects of adversity, the effects of the trial to condition us so that we can go the distance. And the third thing is that we, in order for faith and grace to grow through a trial, We must receive the brokenness that only comes from the Lord. Isaiah 64, 8 says, O Lord, you're our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. And all of us are the work of your hand. See, there's a brokenness that comes from the Lord, not because of the trial, but because of our submission as clay to be formed and fashioned to God's will within the trial. This glow stick, represents our life in the hands of the Lord. And when we receive uh, and submit to the brokenness that comes from the Lord, it is not to hurt us. It's not to weaken us. See, submission to His brokenness only makes us stronger. And when we submit to His brokenness, something begins to happen in our hearts, just like this glow stick. Our life will begin to shine bright, and that's when people will see Jesus in us. For if things were always easy, our faith does not show. If things were always easy, our faith doesn't grow. See, it's when things are hard and life knocks us down flat of our backs, we can look up to Him. And if we can look up to Him, we can get up. And if we can get up, we can stand up in faith. And when we stand up in faith, That's when Jesus in us, His love, His grace, His light shines brightest the most. I trust this has been an encouragement to you today. May the Lord bless you.